Good morning. Well, John is stepping in for Pastor Stan today in celebration worship. And so I am stepping in for John. And I'm pretty certain that makes me basically a third string preacher. But nevertheless, you are stuck with me. We are continuing our series in the story as we look at and discover how scripture is one cohesive narrative of God his people, and his plan to bring wholeness to a a broken world. So far, we have seen how God creates, and he does so with great intentionality and purpose. We have seen how his good creation is then infiltrated with sin and brokenness because of humanity's choices. We have seen how in the midst of all the mess, God chooses a family and says, you will be my people the people I will use to bless the whole world. We have seen how God's chosen people later find themselves in slavery in Egypt, but God hears their cries and he raises up a leader to deliver them from their oppression so that they might be free to worship him and to fulfill their created purpose. We have seen how God speaks to his people on Mount Sinai and says, this is how you are to live in the world as my covenant people. And that leads us to today's part of the story. The Israelites have left Mount Sinai, and they are headed toward the land promised to Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and now to Moses and the people. By fire at night and a cloud by day, God has led them to the entrance of the promised land. And at this point, Moses selects 12 men, one from each of the 12 tribes of Israel, to go through all the land surveying the people in the area. But when they returned from their mission, 10 of the 12 spies said, what were we thinking? We cannot do this. The people that live in this land, they are too big and they are too strong. We are like grasshoppers compared to them. And so the Israelites, they hear this less than optimistic report and they absolutely refuse to enter the land God had prepared for them. They rebel against Moses, against Aaron, and ultimately they rebel against God. Their consequence... Well, it's to wander in the Arabian desert for 40 years. Now, before we continue in our story, I want to play a little game. I personally love games. I love competition. I love to win. I love to talk a little trash. But of course, it's always in good fun. And you all seem like relatively normal, reasonable people. And so I'm confident you love games just as much as I do. But just in case you don't, and you're already feeling your anxiety levels start to climb, I promise you this game is not too intimidating. In fact, there is not even a declared winner or loser, so it can hardly even qualify as a game. I'm sure most of you have played it before, perhaps on a family road trip. It is called Would You Rather. So here's how it works. I'm going to give you two options, and you simply choose which one you would rather do. But you have to choose You have to vote. There is no neither option. There is no I'm going to need a week to think it over option. You must choose. Deal? Okay, here we go. Number one, would you rather use eye drops made of vinegar or toilet paper made from sandpaper? So by show of hands, everyone for eye drops of vinegar, raise your hand. Okay? Okay. Everyone for toilet paper made of sandpaper, raise your hand. Okay. I'm thinking I would go for the eye drops of vinegar because you don't, I mean, let's just be serious. You don't have to use that as much as you use toilet paper. But number two, would you rather have the hiccups for the rest of your life or always feel like you need to sneeze but not be able to? Okay. So everyone for hiccups for the rest of your life, show hands. Okay, always feel like you have to sneeze but not be able to. Okay, we're kind of, this is kind of a split room, I feel like. All right, number three. Would you rather have bad breath or smelly feet? Everyone for bad breath. We got like one, I think. Okay, um, smelly feet. I think that's about all the other 350 of you. Okay, this is probably my favorite one. Would you rather have fingers for eyelashes or eyelashes for fingers, okay? So everyone for fingers for eyelashes, raise your hand, okay? Everyone for eyelashes for fingers, 
Okay, most of you seem pretty sensible. I mean, because let's just be serious. I mean, you can't really do anything if you have eyelashes for fingers. I mean, my goodness, how are you going to get anything done? And then here's the last one. Would you rather always have Cheeto dust on your fingers or always have food stuck in your teeth? Okay, everyone for the Cheeto dust. It's like a ready snack anytime you need it. Okay, most of you. All right, what about food stuck in your teeth? All right, not as many. Okay, well, thank you for playing along. Now, clearly, neither of the options in each of those scenarios were ideal. You would never wish, at least I don't think you would, for your toilet paper to be made of sandpaper. It is not what you want for your life. It is not what you desire, but it is better than the alternative. And that was the wilderness experience for Israel. The wilderness was not ideal. The wilderness was not where they wanted to be but it was better than the alternative. It was better than being slaves back in Egypt, even though Israel didn't always see it that way, as we will discover here in a little bit. They are not where they once were, but they have also not yet reached where they are headed. They are stuck in this sort of in-between period. And when you really stop and think about it, that's life. That is reality for the people of God. We are not where we once were, but we have also not yet reached where we are headed or are fully who we want to be this side of heaven. And so this morning, as we unpack a piece of Israel's story, we are going to examine the question, how do we live in that space in between? How do we live in the wilderness? I believe one insight we can glean from the scripture is that in the wilderness, We are called to be people of gratitude rather than people of grumbling. In Numbers chapter 11, Israel has left Mount Sinai. God has led them by a cloud and by fire. He has provided them with food to eat. He has sustained them. But they are sick of all the manna, and they believe it's about time they had some meat for a change. Numbers chapter 11, beginning in verse 4. The rabble with them began to crave other food. And again, the Israelites started wailing and said, If only we had meat to eat. We remember the fish we ate in Egypt at no cost. Also the cucumbers, melons, leeks, onions, and garlic. But now we have lost our appetite. We never see anything but this manna. Now clearly, Israel here has lost all perspective. They are wailing and complaining and grumbling. And they cry out and say, we remember the fish we had in Egypt at no cost. No cost. Really, no cost. They may have had meat to eat in Egypt. They may have had cucumbers and melons and leeks and onions, but they are fooling themselves if they really believe all those things came at no cost to them. Exodus tells us the Egyptians despised the Hebrew people. They made their lives bitter. They worked them ruthlessly. They killed their sons. That Egyptian meat came at a very high price. But Israel somehow seemed to have forgotten all of that. All they could see was their current problem, their current situation. And it was that tunnel vision of theirs that gave birth to grumbling. They couldn't see God's past acts of faithfulness. They couldn't see the exodus or the covenant or how God had met their every need with manna. All they could see was what they didn't like. All they could see was what they wished was different about their life and it robbed them of their gratitude. Now lucky for us all these thousands of years later, we would never act that way. Now would we? You know, I believe the easiest way for us to open the door for grumbling in our life is through comparison. And when you really stop and think about it, most of our comparisons are unrealistic and a distortion of the truth. Take Israel, for example. 
they begin to grumble and complain when they compare the less than appetizing manna that God has so graciously provided in the wilderness with the meat and the luscious vegetables they had back in Egypt. They romanticize this other life they once had. It's like they have completely lost touch with reality as they compare the very worst of their now with the very best of their then. Now, of course, we can stand back and look at the pages of Scripture and see the error and the ridiculousness in Israel's ways, but still, we do this all the time. We compare our worst with somebody else's best, and we allow it to steal our joy, to steal our gratitude. You know, I would be lying if I said there weren't days I believe my life would be better if I was just married like most of my friends. If I had more money, if I was thinner, if I had a bigger house, if I could afford to go on better vacations. And in a social media driven world, it is so easy to look at the very best in other people's lives and to allow that tunnel vision to take over where now all I can see is what I wish was different about my life. But then there are other days, days I pray will become more often than not when my vision begins to widen and I gain a better perspective and I'm able to be grateful not just in singleness but for singleness and for the way it affords me the time to strengthen not only my relationship with the Lord but to also cultivate deeper, more meaningful friendships with others. There are days I'm grateful for a smaller house because first and foremost, it's a house. It's a home, it's shelter, and let's be honest, it's also less to clean. And there are even days I'm grateful I'm not thinner because chips and queso really are that good. Can I get an amen? (laughs) But the thing about gratitude is, it is not this magical, warm, fuzzy feeling that just wells up within us at random moments, but it is a conscious choice. It is a conscious choice to see the bigger picture to look for the good, to stop with the comparisons, to bite your tongue with the grumbling. It is a conscious and a disciplined choice that comes from staying connected to God, the one who sustains. You know, just a couple weeks ago, I was tucking my seven-year-old son into bed, and we were listening to the song, Ever Be. It's a song we sing often here in the gathering. I am not going to sing it for you this morning, but the chorus says, your praise will ever be on my lips. So in the darkness of the room with the song playing in the background, my son asked the question. He always asks really good questions. He says, mom, how can we really do that? I mean, at some point we're going to have to talk about other stuff. And so I thought for a second about his question and how best to explain it, because he's exactly right. In order to function in society, at some point, we're going to have to talk about other stuff. But after a brief pause, I answered and I said, well, it means we're to be thankful. Thankful for all God has done. And even though every word that comes from our mouth cannot always be, thank you, God, or I love you, God, We can still show that when we choose not to complain and when we show how much God loves people by brightening their day with kind words. So as we live in the wilderness, as we live in the space between where we were and where we want to be, may we be people who are immensely grateful. May the words on our lips, the words that are just always on the tip of our tongue be words of thanksgiving words of encouragement, words of praise, words that uplift, that challenge, that motivate. Because on the journey of life, the people of God are called to walk differently. Now, does that mean we are never going to get upset or worried or anxious or frustrated? Of course it doesn't. But it does mean we don't stay there, that we don't live there. And that the sting of life is soothed with the knowledge that God sees it all and he is present with his people. Not only are we called to be people of gratitude rather than people of grumbling, but we're also called to be people of faith 
rather than people of fear. In Numbers chapter 14, the spies who explored Canaan have just given their report. And they say how the people living in this land, they are like giants and that Israel will surely be destroyed. And here is how the people respond, beginning in verse 1. That night, all the members of the community raised their voices and wept aloud. All the Israelites grumbled against Moses and Aaron, and the whole assembly said to them, If only we had died in Egypt or in this wilderness, why is the Lord bringing us to this land only to let us fall by the sword? Our wives and our children will be taken as plunder. Wouldn't it be better for us to go back to Egypt? And they said to each other, we should choose a leader and go back to Egypt. So here they go again with all the let's just go back to Egypt talk. I mean, by the way Israel sounds, you would think Egypt was just amazing, that they got the royal treatment there or something. But really what we see in Israel's response that I believe is something we can identify with is how the familiar, even as harsh as it may be, often seems so much better than the unknown. Because the familiar doesn't require faith. The familiar may be hard, it may be exhausting, it may be lonely, but at least we know what we can expect. One author puts it this way, she says, fear keeps us rooted in the past. Fear of the unknown, fear of abandonment, fear of rejection, fear of not having enough, fear of not being enough, fear of the future. All these fears and more keep us trapped, repeating the same old patterns and making the same choices over and over again. Fear prevents us from moving outside the comfort or even the familiar discomfort of what we know. Israel knew Egypt. They knew what it was like to be a slave. And so when faced with the choice between the familiar and the unknown, Israel says, give me Egypt. It was easier for them to succumb to their fears and to spend the rest of their life as a slave than to take God at his word. So this morning, what promise of God are you having a hard time believing? Where are you choosing fear? Where are you choosing to sit in familiar discomfort rather than have faith that what God has in store is infinitely better? I remember when I was about five or six years old, I was asked to be the flower girl in my uncle's wedding. Now, that's a pretty big deal, being the flower girl in the wedding. And I can remember on the day of the wedding, showing up to the church and then bringing out this hideous, mauve-colored, lacy dress. Now, I was both mortified and completely confused because they asked me to be the flower girl, which in my mind meant that I would be sporting super comfy green sweats, and I would get to have my face painted, and they would somehow figure out how to attach little petals around my head because, again, they asked me to be the flower girl. Are you with me? You understand how I came to that very reasonable, logical conclusion. So you can imagine my disappointment when I learned this was not going to be some sort of second Halloween for me. And that I, being the very big tomboy that I was, would not only have to wear this hideous dress, but I would have to wear it in public. And once I saw that crowd of people, I was paralyzed with fear. I did not want to go. I did not want to walk down that aisle. This whole thing was not what I had signed up for. And it basically took my cousin, who was the ring bearer, leading me down the aisle with one hand while I had my face covered with the other to eventually get me where I needed to go. You know, sometimes we can think that life is just going to be some cute little flower costume. When in reality, it's a hideous mob dress. It is not what we expected. It is not what we signed up for. And if this is the path we are required to walk, then we just flat don't want to walk it. But the thing is, there's often something beautiful about to take place at the end of the aisle. Something so good 
that you just can't help but sit back and be amazed at how God brought it all together. And he doesn't just bring it together, but he sends us people along the way. Our own little ring bearer cousins who will lovingly grab us by the hand and say, come on, you can do this. Close your eyes if you have to, but I'm right here walking with you. Fear keeps us stuck. Fear keeps us as a slave. And most importantly, fear keeps us from both where and who God wants us to be. I'm reminded of 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 16 and 17, where Paul says, So from now on, we regard no one from a worldly point of view. And though we once regarded Christ in this way, we do so no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, that person is a new creation. The old has gone and the new has come. Scripture tells us that God is in the business of making things new. But that seems like a pretty difficult task when we are constantly running from anything that is new. New people, no thanks. New places, maybe later. New opportunities, not now. But if there is anybody on this earth who should be known for their willingness to brave uncertainty, it is the people of God. As we leave behind who we were and journey on toward where we are headed, we must be people of faith rather than people of fear because we do not walk the journey alone. Martin Luther King Jr. once said, faith is taking the first step even when you don't see the whole staircase. Maybe we can't always see the bigger picture. And maybe we don't always know what's waiting at the end of the aisle, but we walk with a God who sees and knows and is present through it all. And then lastly, we are called to be people who remember the faithfulness of God rather than people who forget. Israel has wandered in the wilderness for 40 years. Those who rebelled the first time they came to the entrance of the promised land, most of them had by now passed away. And their leader, Moses, who will not be allowed to enter the land himself, he speaks these words of challenge to the people in Deuteronomy chapter 4. I'll begin reading in verse 32. Ask now about the former days, long before your time from the day God created man on the earth. Ask from one end of the heavens to the other. Has anything so great as this ever happened? Or has anything like it ever been heard of? Has any other people heard the voice of God speaking out of fire as you have and lived? Has any God ever tried to take for himself one nation out of another nation by testings, by miraculous signs and wonders, by war, by a mighty hand and an outstretched arm, or by great and awesome deeds like all the things the Lord your God did for you in Egypt before your very eyes? You were shown these things so that you might know that the Lord is God. Besides him, there is no other. From heaven, he made you hear his voice to discipline you. On earth, he showed you his great fire, and you heard his words from out of the fire. Because he loved your forefathers and chose your descendants after him, he brought you out of Egypt by his presence and his great strength to drive out before you nations greater and stronger and to bring you into their land to give it to you for your inheritance as it is today. Acknowledge and take to heart this day that the Lord is God in heaven above and on the earth below. There is no other. Keep his decree and commands, which I am giving you today, so that it may go well with you and your children after you, and that you may live long in the land the Lord your God gives you for all time. Moses knows he will not be entering the promised land with the people. He knows he will soon be passing the torch onto Joshua. And so this theme we see throughout the book of Deuteronomy is a call to remember to remember who God is and all he has done. Because when you get right down to it, so much of Israel's problems all this time can be traced back to their propensity to forget. They forgot how horrible life was back in Egypt. 
They forgot how the Lord heard their cries and delivered them from their oppression. They forgot how he split the sea before them. They forgot the covenant and how the God of all creation chose them of all the people on earth. He chose them to be his people. They forgot, they forgot, and they forgot. And when you forget God's provision, you become a grumbler. And when you forget his faithfulness, you become fearful. The people of God, we must have a good memory. You know, I don't mean to brag, but I'm often told by my friends that I have a really good memory. Like, if you need someone to recite to you all the lines, and when I say all the lines, I I literally mean all the lines. From the 1995 Sandra Bullock hit film, While You Were Sleeping, I'm your girl. If there is anything you need to know about 90s Christian culture, like, if you just cannot remember all the lyrics to that Point of Grace song, or what WWJD stood for, come see me. I got you covered. I can remember birthdays. I can remember the name of the girl who sat next to me on the first day of kindergarten. I can remember every mean prank my brother and sister ever pulled, but sometimes quickly calling to mind God's faithfulness. Well, it gets a little fuzzy. And in times of doubt, Times of uncertainty, it often seems like it's human nature to forget the good and to hold on to the bad. Negative comments and doubts and fears and worries just seem to make their way to the forefront of our minds so much faster and so much easier than the good. And so we stay in that familiar discomfort and we fear the unknown because we fail to remember all the ways God has seen us through in the past. According to Harvard Health Publishing, there are certain things you can do to keep your mind and memory sharp over the years. For example, they recommend you become a lifelong learner. That means you may take up a hobby or learn a new skill or join a book club or do crossword puzzles. They also recommend you repeat what you want to know. They say when you want to remember something, repeat it out loud or write it down. That way you reinforce the memory or the connection. And much in the same way, I believe there are certain things we can do to keep our spiritual mind and memory sharp as well. I believe one key thing we can do is to tell and to listen to stories of God's faithfulness. You know, sometimes we get together with friends and all we want to talk about is what happened on the most recent episode of This Is Us. And trust me, I get it. In my opinion, the show is the greatest thing to hit television since Zach Morris and Say by the Bell. But sometimes I think we need to find ways and to find time to really sit down with people and to share how God has been good and faithful in your life. And when you stop and think about it, most of the Israelites who are about to enter into the promised land with Joshua, they didn't see the Exodus with their very own eyes. They have heard the stories from their parents and their grandparents and those that have gone before. A couple of years ago, that realization hit me, and it prompted me to call up my mom and say, Mom, I'm sure this is going to sound super random and out of the blue, but I want you to tell me a story of how God has been faithful in your life and in the lives of our family. And I sat there. And I listened to her tell me the story of how when the doctor came into the hospital room to break the news that she's going to be a widow in her 30s because my dad won't beat leukemia, how the overwhelming peace of God surrounded her there in her grief. I was four years old when that happened. And although I have a really good memory, it's not that good. And I needed to hear that story. I needed to listen to my mom tell it so I can file it away in my memory and let it serve as another stake I put into the ground when storms arise and I need to anchor myself in the faithfulness of God. So we need to listen to stories and we need to be willing to share our own stories and be reminded of the goodness and the nearness of God. And then much like the super smart people at Harvard suggested, I believe to keep our spiritual mind and memory sharp, we need to write things down. Whether it's keeping a journal or putting up sticky notes in your home or in your car, write down how God has been faithful in your life. Write down where you have seen him at work. Write it down 
and read it often. Because in a world where the bad and the negative seems to be rearing its ugly head around every corner, we need to be reminded of the good. We need to be reminded who is good in every situation and in every circumstance. So as we live in the wilderness, as we live in the space between where we were and where we are headed, may we be people of gratitude. May we be people who are slow to grumble and complain because God sees and he provides through it all. May we be people of great faith rather than fear because we do not walk on the journey alone. And may we have a good memory. May we remember the faithfulness of God. May we not grow forgetful because the people of God are called to walk differently in the wilderness. We are called to bear the image of Jesus to the world. We are called to engage and interact with the world around us as Jesus did. So whose image are you reflecting? Whose image do people see in the things you say, in the things that are just always on the tip of your tongue? Whose image do people see in the things you worry about, the things that cause you to become fearful? And whose image do people see in the things you easily remember, in the things you hold on to? And as we live in the wilderness, may our prayer always be, God, through my life, may your kingdom come and your will be done here on this earth as it is in heaven. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, God, we thank you so much so much that you, the God of all creation, that you chose us. God, that you chose us and that we do not walk alone in the wilderness. God, we thank you that you see and you know every hurt, every fear, every burden, God. And we thank you that your strength is perfected in our weakness. May we be people of gratitude. When the world looks at us, may they be people who are immensely thankful, people of great faith, and people who remember how you have provided in the past, people who remember your faithfulness. God, and through it all, may we bear your image to the world. May the world see in us the goodness and the faithfulness of God. In your name we pray. Amen. <laughs>